Welcome to this video on pen test reporting and best practices. So this video is going to walk through what a good pen test report looks like. You're going to actually see a pen test report that I wrote and provided to a client at one point in my career. So with that being said, you're going to be able to see what an actual pen test report looks like from an executive summary perspective and a technical summary perspective. And you're going to see why those are important, why we need technical and executive summary. So that way we can explain to technical and non-technical people what we've seen. So you're going to see that. You're going to see how we write these things up. And then we'll take a look at what a bug bounty report kind of looks like versus how this uh, write-up of a pen test report looks like. So at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about comparison. So let's take a look at this report. Before we look at the report, quick disclaimer. The pen test report template that you're about to see is for educational purposes only and is not the template or final report that HackerOne delivers to their clients in HackerOne pen tests. And this is an actual report that was written by me. And all I've done is just stripped any company information out of it and just added HackerOne branding here. So I'm going to cover the first few pages pretty quick, but then we'll get into the executive summary and the technical summary. So you could see here, we just have a basic, here's who we tested, here's the date, et cetera, table of contents, of course. And then as we come through here, we have an assessment overview. Now, this just talks about the uh, how we perform the assessment, so planning, discovery, attack, uh, and reporting. Now, this is based on NIST guidelines, so if you want to look more into that, you are absolutely welcome to. But this just really follows the phases of a uh, attack and just details that for the client so that they can understand what they're getting and what our methodology was. On top of that, we say, hey, here are the assessment components that we performed. So for this one, we performed an external penetration test, and it gives a little bit of information about what an external penetration test is and what we're doing, what our goals are, etc. We also cover the other sections, which we did an internal penetration test and a web application penetration test for this client. On top of that, we have finding severity ratings. So what is critical? How do we define a critical versus something like an informational? So we say, hey, the CVSS score might be a nine on a critical and the exploitations are very straightforward. Where informational is just no vulnerability exists, but hey, you should probably know about this. So these things like a low, maybe even a moderate probably doesn't show up on a bug bounty. Uh, you might have moderate findings on pen test report that just have no impact because they're not necessarily exploitation. You can see here, vulnerabilities exist but are not exploitable or require extra steps such as social engineering, often out of scope when it comes to bug bounties. So bug bounties are really focused on critical and high, where a pen test looks at everything. Okay, so moving on, we also look at risk factors. We look at likelihood. So how likely is this attack to occur? And impact, just like a bug bounty. We want to know what the impact is if this were to be exploited. So here you could see we have the scope. We have external, internal, and then the web application uh, domain that we tested. And then what exclusions we have. So we were not allowed to do any denial of service or phishing or social engineering. And the client did provide us internal access to their network for our laptop. So moving on, here is the executive summary. Now this is very high level. This is for non-technical people. I'm not going to sit here and read it to you, but what I'm going to cover is just why we're writing it this way. We're writing it so that anybody can understand what is here. It says, hey, we tested from August 5th to August 16th. And we talk about every little section. Like here is the external section. What did we perform? Well, the assessment began vulnerability scanning to identify any potential vulnerabilities. And we also search for breached account data, which is common for uh, external testing. We did find an account, but the account did not lead to any access. We identified valid email addresses through Office 365. We attempted password spraying, such as summer 2019 exclamation. These attacks were unsuccessful. So it tells you, hey, here's what we did, and here's what we found. Now, this can get very lengthy if we find a lot of bad things, right? This client was actually pretty decent. So we were able to uh, have a little bit shorter of an executive summary. But importantly, too, is that you talk about the strengths and the weaknesses. 
So this client did utilize uh, a SIM. So they were identifying when we were doing some vulnerability scanning. They were also behind multi-factor authentication on their Office 365 and their web application. They had a strong password policy. So we want to highlight where we see the strengths and we want to talk about the weaknesses. So we did find ses session fixation on a web app. We found potential denial of service and we just discussed that as well. So if you are a C-level or an executive, you can come through here and just say, okay, I understand this without getting super technical on what we were running or what attacks we were doing. Now, we also do a summary or a report card. A lot of people do this differently, but how I do it is I'll say, hey, here's your network penetration test. And here are the types of findings we found from critical all the way down to informational. And you can see they did pretty well. They only had moderates and lower. And we can see what the findings were. So we had some insufficient patching of eternal blue, which is actually usually critical, but the exploit was not able to trigger. So it did fall under a moderate all the way down to those historical account compromises that we did talk about. So they actually did get a network grade of an A because they were pretty well patched. They were behind multi-factor authentication, et cetera. And you can look at this from a C-level and say, okay, here's what they found. Here's what the recommendations are. Very straightforward. That's what we're after for an executive summary. Same thing for the web application. Now we did get a couple highs and we'll take a look at these couple highs and why they're highs and how we write that technically. So you can look at this, say, hey, I've got a couple highs here. This is maybe a concern. I didn't get as great of a grade. And maybe I need to talk to my web team and say, hey, can you please fix this or explain this to me further? This is me thinking as a C-level. Now, on to the technical findings. I'm actually going to scroll through. But what you can see is we have a description of the finding. And it says, hey, this client permitted an unpatched system on the internal network that's vulnerable to eternal blue. We confirmed that the vulnerability likely exists, but we were unable to exploit it because there were no SMB pipes, which is part of the vulnerability. Now, the likelihood is moderate. Malicious actors have used SMB exploitations like eternal blue in recent breaches. Uh, we weren't able to exploit it at this time because user credentials were required on this one. Now, the impact if we exploited it was high. If we gain remote code execution in the system, we own that system. So super important. We point out what the system was, what tools that we used, and we provide references as to uh, timely maintenance and flaw remediation here. And then we provide a screenshot. This just shows, hey, the target's not patched. Even though we weren't able to exploit it, we can verify that the target is not patched. You can see down here that the name pipes were not there, so we weren't able to exploit it. And then we have the a recommended patching from Microsoft themselves on how to actually fix this issue. So I'm going to scroll through here and just cut video. So I want to point out the web application side of things because I think it's super important, especially with bug bounty being so web heavy, and we really want to understand the difference. Now, from pen testing perspective, here is what a technical write-up might look like for something like session fixation. Now, this web application we went there and when we accessed the web page itself, it was providing this ASP.NET session ID. All right, and I can make this just a little bit bigger. It's providing this ASP.NET session ID and you can see it here. Now, when we go and we log in, guess what? The session ID was the same. When we go and we log out, the session ID was the same. What was happening was the session ID never changed. So we're seeing the session ID over and over and over. Unless you close that browser, the session ID was permanent. So as long as this user was logged in and we had captured this session ID, we could imitate the user at any point. So it's important to point out here that, okay, here's the technical side of things. Here's the request that we're seeing. We made this request. You can see it. We're getting the cookie. And you see down here, session ID is set prior to authentication. Then again, at authentication, and then again here when we log out. Now, we also say, hey, the likelihood is moderate. An attacker would have to hijack a user session cookie via social engineering or man the middle attack. At this time, the report cookies are well protected because they had the proper flags on them. That's great. However, the impact would be high if we were able to do it because we could get full remote access to the victim's account. We provide references to what session fixation is in case they need to read more on it. And this is a high finding. However, even though this is a high finding on a bug bounty report, session fixation is usually not considered 
uh, valid or an impact? Because you would have to hijack a user session cookie or you would have to do social engineering or something along those lines. Now, if you had session fixation and you were able to combine that with another vulnerability, then maybe you can prove impact. So you have to chain in these instances maybe to pro provide more impact and show that it actually does something instead of the possibility of having something done. So if we scroll down, we also see the remediation. You see that we recommend that they regenerate the session ID authentication, they time out and replace old session IDs, and they destroy session IDs on logout and generate new login or new IDs on each login. So that is really the vast difference between an executive summary and a technical summary. You saw the executive summary, very high level. You just got the, hey, there's session fixation and the remediation on how to fix it. From a technical perspective, you want somebody to be able to go in and see the evidence and understand, OK, they captured this request. I'm going to go capture the same request and be able to repeat this. Now, a C-level is not going to understand that, but a technical person should. So you should be able to provide the same evidence as you walked through and give exact details on what you did so that they can repeat it. Another example is of this for just one more showing of an example. Here would be, OK, we have the potential of denial of service. You can see that on this screen, we have a forgot your password. And when we go in here and we say, hey, I providing my IP or my email here, not IP, my email address, you can see it says the email doesn't exist in the system. Please contact the system administrator. OK, well, then we have invalid email address. That's giving us user enumeration. It should say something along the lines of incorrect username and or password. But because we have user enumeration and we use, utilize that username and we tried five attempts on this, we actually get account lockout. No ability to reset our password. The account doesn't unlock. You have to have it unlocked by a system administrator. What does that mean? You chain these two together and you have a much bigger impact. You can enumerate the usernames and you can lock the valid usernames out. So if you know that it's an email, which is telling you it's an email, you could sit there and know the email users of that company, just go through and lock them all out, uh, doing some basic enumeration, and you have a very, very potentially dangerous item here, especially if you lock out, say, an administrator or somebody who has the full keys to this, it could get really bad. So we offer remediations and go into that as well. But that's really the vast difference, again, is you want to provide detailed screenshots and you want to be able to understand. And you can look at this and say, I understand what I'm seeing. This person went in, they typed in a invalid email, and you could see the email does not exist. And then when they actually had a valid email address and they uh, entered in the wrong password five times, they locked it out. So they're able to enumerate and lock out accounts. No good. Okay. So you can get as nitpicky when it comes to pen testing as, let's scroll through here, you could see insufficient encryption, deprecated ciphers. Not that important on bug bounty. Okay, they're using weak ciphers. Ciphers have attacks to them. Attackers can decrypt it. Very difficult to do, uh, but not really important for a bug bounty. Coming through, information disclosure. You see there's IIS 10.0 in the server header, ASP net version in here. OK, it tells us they're running on a Microsoft server. That's great. No impact here. What are we using this for? We can maybe chain this information and find an exploit related to it. But the information disclosure itself, a bug bounty program is not going to care, but it is important to a pen test. Same thing with verbose error messages. These low level findings like this, this 404 is clearly a generic IAS 404. So it's telling me we're running Windows again. Just more information disclosure for us, but a bug bounty program is not going to care. And lastly, login form autocomplete enabled. Same thing. Too low for a bug bounty program, but these are the little things that you should be pointing out to improve the overall security of an application when you're doing a pen test. So let's take one look really quick at a bug bounty write up example so you can see what the difference is between these kind of findings and then a write up from a bug bounty platform. OK, so here is a cross-site scripting that happened on Starbucks. And this is on HackerOne under Hacktivity. I just searched for cross-site scripting. And you could see they submitted it to Starbucks. And they said, hey, you've got reflected cross-site scripting 
on your account right here. And the attacker can execute JavaScript on the victim's account just after the authentication process. It says, here's all the platforms that are affected by this vulnerability, and here are the steps to reproduce. So you could see you open the URL, and they provided the payload that they utilized. You log in, and then the JavaScript executes. Here is a screenshot showing the JavaScript executing. OK, and it goes through all the details. It describes the impact. The attacker can execute JavaScript code. So you can utilize this and, uh, through social engineering, elevate something like a reflected cross-site scripting. So this is kind of the little bit of the difference here. A, a write-up for a bug bounty is completely technical. The, you want them to be able to fully go through and understand what you were doing, all the steps to reproduce, etc. On a pen test report, we're looking at the little nitpicky things, and we're looking at an executive perspective. You have to be able to explain this to an executive so that they understand what they're seeing. They don't need this information. This information is for the technical report. The executive summary needs to be high level. It needs to say, I found cross-site scripting. This means that an attacker can execute JavaScript. And how can you remediate, remediate this? You say, hey, we need to do escaping on the user input. Easy enough. Before we go, let's quickly talk about best practices when it comes to pen testing. Now, best practice number one is that you should have clear and open communication with the customer. You should be providing status updates to your customer. This includes start and stop notifications. Me personally, when I do a pen test, I'm telling the customer daily, hey, I'm starting testing right now, and hey, I'm ending testing for the day. That way, if any alerts come up or anything weird happens, they know if it was me testing during that time frame or if something weird is happening outside of testing hours. Some companies will say, hey, just let us know when you're starting and let us know when you're completely done testing. And it really is client dependent, but you should be giving them start and stop notifications regardless. Status updates are also important, and this includes findings. If you are testing, let them know you're testing. If you are finding things, especially critical vulnerabilities, let them know that you're finding them. If you find a critical vulnerability, you should alert the customer immediately. If you're finding small vulnerabilities, you can give them status updates every couple of days just saying, hey, here's where we're at. I found a little bit here, but nothing too critical at this time. Just give the customer some updates and let them know where you're at with testing, that you are testing, and if anything critical comes up, of course, tell them immediately. Now, you should also notify the customer of any issues immediately. And when I say issues, I don't mean vulnerabilities. I mean if the server goes down or the site starts acting weird or something is just not right with what you're testing, the customer should know immediately, especially if it's something that is in production and could cause an outage. They need to know so that they can look at it and fix it. You should also provide the customer with your testing IP address. This way, they know that it's you and any traffic or alerts that go off in the system are because of you and your IP address, and they can identify you quickly. They can also provide you access or add you to access lists so that you aren't blocked during testing. So it's always important to provide your IP address to the client. Of course, stay professional. Make sure that you have permission for the client. And this kind of goes into the last bullet point too. Know your restrictions and always ask if you're unsure. So it's very important to make sure that you understand the scope and you understand the rules of engagement. If the client's rules of engagement are don't do any denial of service attacks, then you shouldn't be doing any denial of service attacks. Or if it's, hey, let us know if you break into the network and don't go any farther until we give you permission, then don't go any farther. Understand the rules of engagement. If you break into the network and you're unsure of the next steps, just ask the client if you're unsure. And these are all pretty straightforward. So if you could follow these and you just have this open line of communication with the customer, you make the customer feel good, you stay professional, and you understand your scope and your limits, you're going to do just fine in terms of best practices. So that is it for this video. As always, my name is a Cyber Mentor, and I do thank you for joining me.